We've now identified three economically meaningful ways of slicing this production function. We started by saying, suppose that capital was already fixed in the short run, and we can only vary labor. In that case, we're operating on a slice of this production function that holds capital fixed, and we can trace out how output's going to change as labor increases. And we can graph that slice by putting x on the, on the vertical axis, labor on the horizontal axis, and tracing out what we call the short-run production function that varies labor but holds capital fixed. We then found that the slope of this function is the marginal product of labor. The additional output we get from hiring one more worker without changing how much capital we have. We could similarly identify the marginal product of capital by holding labor fixed and just varying capital. So if we do that, we're operating on a slice that holds labor fixed, we just vary capital, and we get a similar picture, only now capital is on the horizontal axis, output on the vertical, a slice that looks like this, the slice that holds capital, I mean labor fixed, and just varies capital. And the slope of this would be the marginal product of capital. We then moved to a different slice and said, suppose we pick an output level, a height in this picture, and take a horizontal slice. If we do that, we trace out all the combinations of input bundles that produce the output level that happens at that height in the picture. So we derived an isoquant. And of course, there are lots of isoquants. There's one for each level of output. We can then graph those isoquants in the picture, where we put labor on the horizontal, capital on the vertical, and we get all the input bundles that can produce a certain level of the output. We then looked at the slope of this and said, well, that's the technical rate of substitution the rate at which we can substitute capital for labor and continue to produce the same quantity as before. Now it turns out that that technical rate of substitution is related to the marginal products. So suppose we pick a particular point on this production function. There's an isoquant that goes to this point, but there's also a slice that holds capital fix that goes through at that point and a slice that holds labor fix that goes to this point. So we can measure all three of those slopes Two of those are marginal products. Suppose at that point the marginal product of labor was equal to 3 and the marginal product of capital was equal to 1. That would mean that at that point on the production function labor is three times as productive as capital, which means that we could replace three units of capital with one unit of labor and continue to produce exactly the same as we did before. In other words, we could go down by three and over by one. Well, that's our technical rate of substitution. So the technical rate of substitution at any point is going to be equal to the marginal product of labor divided by the marginal product of capital, since it's negative has a downward slope is actually the negative of that. So there's a relationship between the technical rate of substitution and the marginal products that happen at that input bundle. Finally, we took a different slice in the last module. In that case, we looked at what happens along a ray from the origin. So if we look at a ray from the origin, we're just moving up this mountain varying both capital and labor by the same proportion. So we're moving along, initially it gets steeper and steeper, and eventually it gets shallower and shallower. This slice doesn't tell us the same thing as these slices, because along this slice, we're varying both capital and labor, and marginal product of labor is defined as the additional output we get from one more unit of labor when we hold capital constant and similarly for marginal product of capital. So along this ray from the origin, we're really looking at the concept of returns to scale.
as we vary both outputs together, is output increasing at a faster rate or at a slower rate than what we're varying the inputs together? And so we identified this initial part as increasing returns to scale and this later part as decreasing returns to scale. Now these three slices are economically meaningful in the theory of the firm in a way where only one of them was meaningful in the theory of the consumer where instead of output we measured utility and instead of inputs we measured goods. In the case of utility functions we only took the horizontal slices and we only mapped the indifference curves. We didn't talk about what the slices look like if we hold good one fixed or good two fixed and we didn't talk about what happens as we vary both good one and good two. And the reason for that is that both of these are vertical slices. They rely on the thing on the vertical axis being objectively measurable. If we did the same thing with a utility function, we would get a concept called the marginal utility of good one and the marginal utility of good two. But that's measured in utility terms, in utils and we don't think we can objectively measure those. Similarly, as we climb the utility mountain, how we climb, whether it's getting steeper or shallower, really depends on how we're measuring utility. And so these vertical slices were not meaningful in the consumer model. They now become meaningful in the producer model because what we measure on the vertical axis is objectively measurable.